today's Old Testament lesson from Genesis chapter 15, God's promise to Abram, which began, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceeding great reward. Dear Christian friends, it's been said that there are only two things which are certain in life, namely death and taxes. Well, none of us would argue that those two things are certain, but on the other hand, we could probably add a few things to the list. At the top of our additional list should probably be the word fear. It started with Adam, not when he was created, but after he disobeyed God and fell into sin. Suddenly and immediately, Adam was terrified. He ran and hid himself, and when God asked him why, his answer was, I heard you walking in the garden, and I was afraid. Now, it was not God's intent that anybody ever would be afraid. How many times doesn't God tell us, fear not? In fact, God came after Adam in his fear and immediately relieved that fear by making the very first promise of the Savior to him. And that is still the only permanent cure for fear. God's promise of forgiveness and salvation. How many times in scripture when God sent an angel to speak to men wasn't the first word out of their mouth, fear not. And it's no accident that God begins talking to Abram in our text today with those very same words, fear not, do not be afraid. We don't often admit it as adults, but there's lots of things that make us afraid too. So as we consider this text together, let's take to heart God's comforting word, do not be afraid. I am your shield and I am your very great reward. Fear is an ugly thing. It leads us so often into temptation. It drives us to sin, despair, and losing hope. Those are sins. Fear and faith do not coexist well. Fear comes when we fail to trust God's promise that no harm will befall those who trust in him. Fear comes when we fail to fully believe that God can and will keep his promise to make all things work together for our good. We're guilty of the sin of fear. And it only has one cure and antidote. That is God's reassurance. Sometimes when things are going well, we fear. We get all nervous and superstitious that, well, things can't keep going well. Something bad has got to happen. We often ride the waves in life from highs to lows. The higher we feel, the harder we hit the dirt when something negative happens. And that's actually what happened to Abraham. If you flip back a chapter, back to chapter 14 of Genesis, you'll find that Abram was definitely on a high. You might recall how four kings had come and made war on Sodom, where Lot's nephew was living, and had plundered the city, taken all the goods, but also had taken all of the people, including Lot and his family. They were prisoners of war. And so Abram summoned together all his farmhands, all his shepherds, and they went after, they went in pursuit of four kings and their armies, and God had miraculously given Abram complete victory. Abram was able to rescue Lot and his family. 
And as he was on his way back home, he passed the city that would later be known as Jerusalem. And seemingly out of nowhere, a priest came to Abram, a man by the name of Melchizedek, who happened to be a priest of the true God, it's the only place we hear of him, and he came out and he pronounced the blessing of the Lord on Abram. What a day. It was pretty obvious that the Lord was with Abram. In fact, God had so greatly blessed Abram materially that when the king of Sodom urged him to take all the plunder as a reward for rescuing him and his people, Abram refused, saying, I have raised my hand to the Lord God most high, creator of heaven and earth, and have taken an oath that I will accept nothing belonging to you so that you will never be able to say, I made Abram rich. Abram was already rich, and he wanted everybody to know that it was the Lord that had made him rich, just as it was the Lord who gave him success in battle. Have you ever had a day like that? A day when everything went your way, and you can scarcely even take it all in? Abram sat back that evening and began to ponder all the wonderful things God had done for him. God took me out of Ur of the Chaldees and, and brought our family to Haran and then God accompanied me on my journey to Canaan and, and he's promised that I will get to have this land and I will have descendants as, as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore, God has, wait a minute, God's promised me descendants and I'm an old bugger and I still don't have any kids and, and my wife, not only is she old, but she's been barren her entire life. And so just like that, Abram went from this fantastic high thanking God for all his gifts to his mind being plagued by fear and doubt and isn't that just the way our minds work too just when we're pondering God's blessings Satan injects worry into our minds like a Zika virus even though God has brought us thus far, we start worrying about how we are going to get ourselves through the rest of our lives. Abram called out, O oh Lord God, what can you give me, since I remain childless, and the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus? And Abram said, You have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. These weren't just problems that Abram had dreamed up. These were very real problems, genuine concerns. We might say that Abram was being perfectly and totally realistic. After all, he was getting close to 100, and his wife was getting close to 90. And even when she was young, she had never been able to conceive, even though they'd tried again and again to have a child. These facts seem to fly in the face of God's promise to make Abram into a great nation. And that very understandably caused him to be afraid for the future. More than that, if Abram would remain childless, what was even the point of moving a thousand miles to Canaan? And, and what was the point in even trusting that, that there ever would be a savior? These were definitely realistic worries. But God did not want Abram to be realistic. God wanted Abram to have faith. God creates reality. And so God came to Abram in his fearful state 
and said, do not be afraid. This man, Eliezer, your, your loyal servant, is not going to inherit your estate, but a son coming from your own body will be your heir. God had promised Abram, I am your shield. And that he was. He was going to protect Abram from fear, and he was going to protect him from all the things that cause fear. He would protect Abram from childlessness, just as he promised. He would protect Abram from dying without an heir, as he feared. He would protect the promised land that he had offered to Abram and to his descendants. And he would protect Abram and all people with him from eternal death by sending that descendant, the seed of Abram, to be the savior of the world. Abram realistically had no cause to fear. We all worry too much. God is not unaware of our fears and worries. How am I going to get by on my social security check? How am I going to get by on my income? What happens if, if I lose my job? What happens if the, the market crashes? What happens if any of these realistic fears of mine come true? What's going to happen to our congregation in the future? And then God says, I am your shield. Real problems? Oh, yeah. Real protection? Even more so. God does not say to you in his word, be realistic. Instead, God says, have faith. Don't be afraid. And not only does God promise to protect us, he also promises all sorts of good things. He said, do not be afraid, Abram, I am your shield and your exceeding great reward. And then in Abram's case, God put it in very concrete terms. Look up at the heavens and count the stars if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. Promises, promises. People make promises all the time. And we judge those promises based on who that person is. When politicians make promises to us, we don't trust one of them. We just take that as par for the course. If somebody that, that's lied to you before makes a promise, you don't put any trust in him. But who was it that made this promise to Abraham? It was Emmanuel, the God who is with us. The God who had never let Abram down. The God who had carefully and safely brought Abram out of Ur of the Chaldees and brought him to the promised land. The God who had given Abram all those, all those flocks, all that wealth, all those workers, all that land. It was God who had blessed Abram in the past and prospered him so richly. He's the one that promised that he would give Abraham descendants as countless as the stars. God had also promised Abram, all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So what would make Abram's still not their descendants so great that all nations would be blessed through him? St. Paul explains it clearly in Galatians 3.16. The promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. The scripture does not say, and to seeds, meaning many people, but and to your seed, meaning one person who is Christ. Once more, God reiterated to Abram the promise that had been the theme of his 
dealing with people from the very beginning, the promise that represents the golden thread that runs all through the Old Testament, the promise that one day a Savior would come. Yes, God complimented that promise by saying, Abraham, you're going to have lots of descendants. They're the ones who I'm going to give my book to. They're the ones who are going to to keep the faith alive among the nations. But Abram, I am going to send you a great, 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 great grandson who is going to pay for your sins and the sins of all the world. And he is going to open the gate to you to the real and everlasting promised land, the city whose foundation is God, as we heard in our epistle lesson. Did Abram understand all this? Well, if you can trust Jesus, 2,000 years later, Jesus said to his fellow Jews, your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and was glad. No, Abraham didn't have all of the details of the Savior's work that have been made known to us. But he knew one thing for sure. He knew that this was the promise that God had been repeating since he first spoke it to Adam and Eve. The seed of the woman would crush the serpent's head and undo the damage that kicked us out of paradise. And Abraham believed. Our text says, Abraham believed the Lord and he accounted, he credited it to him as righteousness. God was indeed Abram's great reward and he knew it and he accepted it wholeheartedly. What does Moses mean when he uses that word credited or accounted? Well, you can tell from how the words sound in English. These are banking terms. Jesus has earned forgiveness and justification for everyone. But if we don't believe that, we go unforgiven. <laughs> forgiveness is like, is like a check from God. And when we cash that check through faith, all of the good gifts of God, forgiveness, life, and salvation are ours. Our sins are gone forever. Christ's righteousness is credited to our account. And the accountant says, oh yeah, that's paid in full. That's what Abram did. He cashed the check. He believed God. He trusted his promise and it was credited to him as righteousness, justification, forgiveness. Through faith, Abraham was right with God. God wants us to be right with him too. The same plan of salvation that rescued Abram and gave him God's very great reward still holds true today. The Apostle Paul wrote, the words it was credited to him were written not for him alone, but also for us to whom God will credit righteousness for us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. As we said earlier, there are more than two things, death and taxes, which are certain. There's also fear. Fear that we have to deal with all the time in our lives. We get scared. And nothing scares us more than our own personal guilt before God. But we've seen in our text that there are other certainties too. God's word is certain which says to us, don't be afraid. Jesus is certain, who says to us, your sins are forgiven. God is certain when he credits our faith to us as righteousness and when he promises to us, I am your shield, your very great reward. Amen.